Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to VUX World, the practical voice podcast. I'm on my own today. There's no Dustin and there's no guest. And I'm going to just run through some of the things we've been discussing on LinkedIn to see if we can unpack some of this stuff a little bit more. If you haven't joined me on LinkedIn, do so. Every day I've been posting a different video, asking the voice community a different question. And we've been having a discussion trying to get to the bottom of some really important issues and topics. Uh, This week has been predominantly about discoverability. So we had Voice Flow, Braden Ream from Voice Flow on the podcast on Tuesday and we were discussing discoverability and how important discoverability is and how we need to crack that particular nut because it leads to everything else uh, and which I'll come on to in a moment and that kind of like that was almost like the running theme for for the week and there's some interesting discussions happening so Braden's point, if you haven't heard the podcast check it out, we we debated this for nigh on an hour Um, I've got a cold by the way today, that's why my voice is a little bit husky Husky, is husky the word? Croaky is probably... Husky sounds really macho and cool. In reality, it's croaky as hell. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we had Braden Ream on and we discussed this discoverability thing for about an hour. And Braden phrased it in a really good way that I've never come across before. Braden mentioned that discoverability is the tip of the iceberg and it leads to everything else. If you imagine things being a triangle, and I mentioned this uh, in the video on LinkedIn, if you imagine the tip of the triangle is discoverability and after that you have engagement. So before people can engage with your skill regularly, they need to be able to find it in the first place. And so after discovery comes engagement, after engagement comes repeat usage. So if people engage with your skill and it's good enough and you can get them back to it, they continue using it. And then after engagement and usage comes monetization. And if this industry is going to support businesses, if businesses are going to be built on these platforms, then monetization is important. Now, we kind of have monetization it's probably in its infancy. There's some clunkiness around account linking, but broadly speaking, you can monetize voice applications. You can use for Alexa, you can use in skill purchasing, you can use Amazon Pay, or you can use credit card or debit card details that you have on file if you do go down the account linking route. So the the monetization part is there. The engagement and repeat usage part isn't quite there at the moment, and we discussed this again with, with Braden. I'm wondering whether people are taking full advantage of everything that is out there and all of the features and, and things that p- the platforms provide. Uh, we, another video I put out there was, was talking about notifications and reminders. So how many people are actually using notifications in their skills? How many people are actually using reminders in their skills? And are they being used or, or are they working rather now, there was some comments uh, about how if you try and use reminders, uh, sorry, notifications in your skill, then you might not get through certification for whatever reason. So I don't know whether there are specific use cases and specific kind of criteria to meet for Amazon to certify a skill with a uh, notification in it. Um, so perhaps there is some barriers or blockages from the platforms there, but either way, are people using reminders or notifications? Have you tried using reminders and notifications and has it had an impact on people returning back to the skill? The, the, the common thing that would be said against that would be, well, no one wants to have a notification flashing on the smart speaker because all they would be doing is being infiltrated and bombarded by notifications on smart speakers. Over time, that may kind of be the case, but you kind of need to get through that sort of saturation point before you come out the other end and say that it's a bit too much. I know that we've got notifications on our every other device. And in fact, I've actually turned the vast majority of my notifications off my phone, off the iPad and all of my devices. And I choose when to engage with which apps when basically. Um, But that's because I've reached peak notification on my phone and watch but I don't think I've reached peak notification on my smart speaker, for example. Um, most of the time, the, the only notifications I get on my uh, Alexa Echo devices is when I'm waiting for a package to be delivered. 
And the ironic thing is, I usually have the package on my doorstep on my way into the house. So I've got the package in my hand before I even see the notification. So yes, there's challenges with notifications in terms of are people going to be in. And now I know, but the thing is, I know what the notification is. I know it's the the Amazon parcel because that's the only notification that I get. So I think there is things to be explored there around notifications and using notifications more effectively because I don't think we've even scratched the surface of of this. You know, we're not at the point yet where people are going to be resisting it because they don't want the devices flashing uh, all day long because we haven't even tried it yet. We haven't even got to that point. There's things that I probably would have notifications on. BBC skill prime example i would have notifications from bbc on alexa uh, i would also have notifications from the bbc uh kids skill whenever there's an update tell me about it you know uh, and i don't want to pick on the bbc because the bbc are one of the few companies that are doing absolutely fantastic stuff there um, but it's still a question of the industry if the bbc are one of the companies who are far out and in front in terms of their usage and the traction that they're having and the dedication they're placing into this platform if they're so far in front are they are they taking advantage of all of the features that are available to us as well to to bring people back to the the experience um i don't know the answer to that and i'm not suggesting that they're not but i haven't had a notification suggestion for example or a reminder suggestion uh from the bbc so i think that the the engagement piece and people kind of like there is there is a bit of a a vibe at the moment that that people are sort of um starting to be more vocal or, or unhappy about things like retention and discoverability which is completely warranted certainly if you are someone like georgia quinter for example who's been trying to crack this nut for four years and he makes some extremely valid points about how difficult it's been um but so there seems to be some some people being relatively vocal about it at the moment and my response is at the moment have we fully utilized everything that the platform has to offer in order to increase that engagement? Have we utilized other channels as well? You know, I, I put a video out talking about this discoverability thing and James Poulter from Vixen Labs had responded to it with, um, if you were to create an app or a website or any other digital product of any kind, if you're a brand, you would put all of your efforts into promoting it. You would market the shit out of it, right? You would put budget behind it. You would have it all over your paid, earned and owned channels. And you would just treat it like everything else that you do. You would just, you know, every single customer touch point, you would be promoting it and you would be driving traffic to it. I haven't seen uh, a brand fully, fully do that and fully embrace this and put it across every single one of their channels. I think the the exception possibly is Talisker Whiskey. You know, Charlie Cadbury uh, of Sait Now, Sander Sizen and uh, Will Harvey of uh, Diageo. Uh, They've got this Talisker Tasty uh, Talisker Tasty Talisker Tasting experience. You you buy a bottle of Talisker Whiskey and uh, as an accompaniment to that you can use the Alexa skill and it will take you through a guided tasting experience. It kind of augments the product experience and it gives you an experiential kind of experience of the product. They put the uh, the works with Alexa or try, just ask Alexa on the package of the bottle. They had it all over the Asda uh, front page of the website and they've been pushing it really, really heavily. And I don't know the numbers behind the usage, but it seems to be doing fairly well. There's videos of people testing it out online. They've had some good PR around it. So that's probably the only example where I've seen uh, a brand put a bit of weight behind it and it seems as though it's working, you know. Um, Had it increased sales of Talisker Whiskey? I'm not entirely sure. Did it have to? I don't know. Is it good? Is it a good enough thing to to provide an experiential uh, accompaniment to a product to increase your kind of trust and loyalty amongst your current customers? I think that's a good enough idea in the first place. Um, So, yeah, point being, I don't think that we fully explored or seen enough examples of everybody, first of all, exploring the full capabilities of the platform and putting enough marketing 
budget and weight behind getting things adopted in the first place. I mean, if you think about what it takes to create uh, a successful voice application on Google or Alexa, right? You need to start with a valid use case, right? Ben Sauer always mentions that the first thing you need to do is design the right thing before you can think about designing the thing right. So you need to design the right thing. You need to have a valid use case. To find that use case, you need to have people from all over the business that have contact with users and who know the pain points of users. You need to have analysts looking at what your contact is, what people are coming at you for, and what people need from you, from, from your business. You need user researchers to go out there and speak to uh, your actual customer base. And then you need designers and developers to come up with something uh, and strategists to come up with something that is going to work, right? And then again, you need testing, you need hypothesis testing and all that kind of stuff. And then you need to design the thing right, as Ben Sauer mentioned. So you need, again, design, technical development, you need subject matter experts uh, and a whole host of you know, designers, graphic designers and VUI designers. Uh, and building the thing and testing the thing and delivering it in the first place. All of all of that is, is a good chunk of work. You know, it takes probably about three months to create uh, a decent uh, Alexa skill, for example. And then after that, you need promotion, you need marketing strategy, you know, you know, you need to get the word out and get it adopted. And then you need, again, further analysts and further design and development work to take that feedback and improve it and iterate it over time and then to implement the roadmap. It needs to become part of what the business does. And so it takes a hell of a lot of time, effort and money just to get something up and running in the first place and to do it properly and to do it well. Again, I don't know whether I've seen too many examples of all of those links in that chain being done properly and to great effect. And it's no wonder that hobbyists are having a fairly hard time turning this into a living. It's because you need so many different skills. You need time to spend on it and you need budget to promote it. And we had this debate again about who, whether it's the brand's job to promote it or whether it's Amazon and Google's job to promote it. And I know that there's people with, with views on that, um, but I don't think it's solely down to the platforms to, to do it for you. I think that there needs to be some realism uh, in that if you want this to be used, then you need to put your hand in your pocket and, and promote it. Who's uh Ah, I'm late for a podcast with Dustin. That's interesting. Didn't have my didn't have my uh, my beeper go off. So I will wrap this up then. Uh, discoverability is an issue, without a shadow of a doubt. I'm not convinced I've seen enough um, efforts put into getting people to use skills that the brands have created in the first place. There is examples there where people have tried it. The argument there is, have you got a good enough use case in the first place? Is, have you designed the thing well enough in the first place? Have you then used the tools that are available to you to get people to return to your uh, voice experience in the first place? I don't know whether all of those links in the chain have come together for any one single person at the moment. And I don't think that's because it can't. I just think because it hasn't been seen as a proper channel. It's been seen as an experimental research based, uh, kind of like innovative channel to experiment on. It hasn't been taken as the next app store for argument's sake. And there's a whole lot of parallels that you can draw between the app store and voice platforms, but I don't think that they are the same. And I don't think that they are, uh, I don't think that the trends that happened in mobile are necessarily the trends that we'll see in voice because it's a totally new interface. It's a totally new medium, totally new paradigm. The use cases are totally different. And I don't think that we can just take the app model of monetizing apps and apply it to voice. And people say that apps are dead. Um, I don't actually think apps are dead. I think that it's difficult to create a new app if you're a hobbyist and get that to be successful. But I do think that apps are still relevant. I mean, I downloaded an app the other day, the EasyJet app. I downloaded the EasyJet app the other day. I've been using that to find flights to Frankfurt for the um, Voice Connected Business Conference in next year. So I don't think I don't think apps are dead. Uh, but I don't think that voice is the same as, as the app store. I don't think that the skills necessarily are exactly the same. So I don't think that the market 
growth and trajectory and all that kind of stuff that happened in mobile, I don't think we can just apply it to voice because I think it's totally different. We had mobile phones in our pockets for years before the App Store was released. We were used to that device. We've only had smart speakers in our houses in America at absolute most, what is it, four year? Five year, it was the fifth anniversary of the other week. Five year, absolute tops. In the UK, it's like two or three, you know. So we haven't had these devices in our homes anywhere near as long as we had mobile phones. Um, so I, I, I really don't think that the two are, are the same. Um, anyway, point being, yes, discoverability is important. I don't think I've seen anyone use all of the tools that are available to them. Uh, first of all, to get people to the skill and then to keep people in the skill after that. If I'm wrong, please do tell me. And if you haven't joined me on LinkedIn, please do join me on LinkedIn, Kane Sims, K-A-N-E-S-I-M-M-S, and join the discussions next week. Until next time, see you later.